Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Dark Souls 2 Dissected. So, the Souls games have always had a surprising amount of freedom when it comes to attacking NPCs. Most games will find ways to disable friendly fire against important characters, while Dark Souls never worry too much about the ramifications. If the player wanted to shoot themselves in the foot by losing someone helpful, that was their decision to make. There are a couple of exceptions in the earlier games. For example, the Maiden in Black in Demon Souls was protected by plot armor. I'm sorry. I cannot die. Not while the Nexus binds me. But otherwise, the original version of Demon Souls didn't have a mechanic for absolving sin. If you merely aggroed an NPC, there was no way to get them to forgive you. There's nothing to stop you from attacking both blacksmiths right away, making your game much, much harder as a result, because you'd have no way to upgrade your weapons. What the hell are you doing? I'm just a blacksmith, you fool! Dark Souls 1 introduced the absolution mechanic, where you could pay to have NPCs forgive you. Its ability to actually help depended on the situation, though in most cases it would result in getting NPCs to de-aggro, also allowing you to rejoin most covenants you've angered. But you can tell that From Software was having some kind of internal debate on how to handle all of this. They still wanted the potential for serious penalties if you went around attacking NPCs, but they also probably recognized that players might do it by accident. A lot of people have bumped the shoulder buttons when setting their controller down, for example, and they likely agreed that there should be some way to correct that mistake. But despite the introduction of Absolution in Dark Souls 1, they were still on the fence about its accessibility. The explanation of how all worked was very vague and cryptic, and someone new to the game might not know it existed at all. This resulted in a lot of players thinking that they had to kill off an angry NPC, not realizing it could be fixed. It was also very expensive originally, costing four times as many souls before they patched it. And they also didn't stop you from being able to attack the NPC that offered Absolution, so it was still possible to lose that feature for your entire playthrough. For Dark Souls 2, they weren't on the fence any longer. They went one step further and implemented the most forgiving mechanic the series has seen thus far. The ability to bring NPCs back from the dead. So, almost every NPC in Dark Souls 2 can be temporarily revived if you kill them. The way it works is it places a tombstone near their most recent location. If you pay some souls to interact with it, you'll be able to revive them to speak with them again. But you might find yourself waiting several hours for the tombstone to first arrive, and I'll talk more about how that works later. Once it's there, the tombstone will remain where it is for the rest of your current playthrough, so it never goes away, but anytime you reload or return to the area, you'll still have to pay souls to use it again. It's not a one-time purchase. This mechanic was necessary to see an NPC after their death, as bonfire aesthetics don't respawn NPCs, and you have to go into the next New Game Plus cycle to fully revive everyone otherwise. However, the usefulness of reviving an NPC can be very dependent on context, so if an NPC's services are important to you, you might want to think twice before assuming there aren't any downsides to killing them off. Well, thank you for coming back. Do take a look at my wares. First off, NPCs that are normally available for co-op won't have their summon signs come back, so you'll lose access to that. And more importantly, NPC questlines typically get frozen where they were. For example, if we kill Carhillion in No Man's Wharf, his tombstone is only going to appear there and it's not ever going to travel to Majula. This means that any NPCs whose services get updated after traveling to new locations are still at risk of being missed out on. Killing Melentia in the Forest of Fallen Giants means she won't ever offer the unlimited life gems that become available when she's in Majula. And killing Ornifex in the Shaded Woods means not getting access to her weaponsmithing that would have been available in Brightstone Cove, Seldora. Generally speaking, though, if an NPC has reached their final location, then newer interactions will become available if you kill them there. Thank you for helping me. For example, if we kill Melentia while she's in Majula instead, there she normally updates her inventory to include more bright bugs after defeating certain bosses. We can kill her before defeating those bosses, and her inventory will still recognize these events and update accordingly. The same goes for Stone Trader Cloanne. If we leave her behind in the Earthen Peak, we'll lose access to her updated inventory. But as long as she's in Majula, her inventory will continue to update just fine. 
So as a sort of baseline assumption, it's fair to assume that killing NPCs too early means missing out on important stuff from them, while killing them late enough in their progression usually means getting to avoid that problem. There are some NPCs who never go anywhere, though, so there actually is no penalty to killing them off right away, aside from the cost of souls to revive and the sin received. Blue Sentinel Targray never leaves his post at the Cathedral of Blue, so he can still do stuff like join his covenant after he's dead. Transient being, you have obtained proof you are worthy of joining our order. The same goes for Tichy Gren. Do you have a lust for blood? There are some NPCs who have updates after staying in the same general location. The blacksmiths don't offer their services until you unlock their areas. I'm a blacksmith. I'm nothing without my tools. But thankfully, the game considers them being in the same map good enough. So even if we kill them before their services are available, we can do things like unlock the door or light the sconce after their death, and still be able to access their services afterwards. You, stand back. This is dangerous work. Though it's pretty easy to get a general idea of what's going to be available, or what you're going to miss out on, depending on when you kill an NPC, there are some exceptions worth noting. Malin only updates his inventory if you meet the spending requirement before killing him, so killing him too soon does screw things up, despite remaining in the same location. Rosabeth's ghost will default to her ragged clothes, and you will be able to gift clothing. There's no fashion souls for her in the afterlife. Though you'll still be able to buy stuff from Navlon, his questline for killing NPCs will come to an end. I'll spend some time traveling the lands, slowly tracking my new mark. Despite his threat of stalking you, his invasions will cease after killing him. The Tombstone Revival won't restart them. By the very gods! What have you done? You've really done it! You'll never escape him! No, I'm pretty sure we did. While the Rat King only appears where he died, as expected, the Bellkeeper NPC will appear at both of his potential locations, regardless of where you kill him. So that's a surprising inconsistency there. What happens to Laddersmith Gilligan is a bit strange. Killing him removes the ability to buy ladders from him. This on its own makes perfect sense because the ladder purchases require cutscenes of him alive. But when he's killed in Majula, they also move his tombstone behind the Majula monument. No other tombstone appears nearly as far from an NPC's normal location. I think this placement was probably inspired by the loss of ladders. Rather than having the player question the mechanics of what services remain from NPC ghosts, it's possible they wanted an obvious visual representation that he's not going to help with that anymore. They accomplished that by moving him far away from the pit. But then again, they didn't bother moving him away from the ledge in the Earthen Peak if you kill him there, so who knows what they were thinking. Dark Diver Grandel doesn't necessarily let you join his covenant and enter the Abyss just because you've met him in all three locations, so you have to be very careful with him. It's possible to wind up with just a tombstone only where you killed him, causing you to lose out on everything. Young undead, my work is done. You need to have spoken with him in all three locations, and also have joined the Covenant through him first. Basically, you need to see one of these light up. If you've done all of that before killing him, then his grave should appear at all three locations, and you won't lose access to the Covenant or the Abyss. And perhaps most importantly, they were kind enough to make it so that the Emerald Herald's tombstone will appear in Majula, regardless if you kill her somewhere else. This means that the ability to level up from her won't be lost. If you're curious about the specifics of what services are lost or when they remain intact, I made a table on the wiki that includes notes about most quirks you should be aware of. If you've killed a few NPCs before, but don't remember seeing any of these, you're probably not alone. They each have a time requirement that delays their arrival after the NPC's death. Back when the game was new, there was a lot of doubt and confusion about their requirements for spawning. A lot of people suspected that reloading areas, traveling around the game, or killing bosses helped bring these tombstones into your game. But it really was just a countdown from the moment of the NPC's death, and nothing else. One of my earliest YouTube videos on this channel was documenting how Maluncha shows up after an hour and a half of waiting, since I had several people trying to convince me it worked differently. In the early days, we didn't have access to any sort of data mined info from the game, 
So as you can imagine, trying to figure out every NPC's wait time was a tedious and time-consuming process. Ever since 2014, the table looked like this, with the exact wait time still missing for over 15 NPCs. I filled in as many wait times as I could before I lost the patience to continue. But now that we do have access to that info, we can see the precise amount of time, in seconds, for every NPC. And I finally updated that table to be complete. Now that we can actually see all of the wait times, we have some better insight into the developer's reasoning behind some of these. Most NPCs take anywhere from a couple of hours up to five hours, and despite being set in seconds in the data, they never set anything more specific than half hour increments. You can see how five hours was reserved for a handful of NPCs of greater importance, perhaps to give you a more serious penalty and to not make you feel too comfortable in just attacking everyone. This includes the Emerald Herald, for obvious reasons, but also Cromwell the Pardoner, whose ability to pardon does remain intact after death. Other five-hour waits also include Targray and Tichy Gren, showing that they considered how the Brotherhood of Blood and Blue Sentinels were going to be the most popular PvP covenants. And lastly, there's Falcon and Strayed, meaning they wanted to put a longer wait on some of the more important spell merchants as well. But there are a few outliers. The shortest wait time in the game is Pate, He's the only NPC to have a wait time of just one hour, everyone else has a wait time of at least an hour and a half. This is understandable, as the developers didn't want to penalize you too hard for killing him, as he can still grant the white sign soapstone after death, and they probably felt like losing easy access to that was going a bit too far. It allows undead to call out for help to one another, across the fissures between worlds. And at the complete opposite end of the spectrum, there's only one NPC to have a wait time longer than five hours. It's Crestfallen Saldan, whose timer suddenly jumps all the way up to 10 hours. Finally, I will have peace. 10 hours later. It's a really absurd amount of time that seems to run a bit contrary to the understandable reasoning behind mostly everyone else's wait time. And when we consider the varying soul costs for revival, Saldan is actually the cheapest NPC you can revive, costing only 500 souls. So if they wanted to punish us with a long wait, why is it so cheap otherwise? I feel fairly confident in saying that it's only because this was a mistake. The soul cost is low because they wanted his tombstone to be easy to access. Like with how they handled Pate, the developers probably saw access to the Way of Blue Covenant as something that would be helpful to new players, so they didn't want to make his tombstone hard to find. When we consider that the difference between a 1 hour wait and a 10 hour wait is 3600 seconds versus 36,000 seconds? I'm going to assume that they just typed an extra zero by accident. That's almost certainly a typo, and Saldan was probably supposed to have the shortest wait time along with Pate, not the longest. Otherwise, there's not too much to take away from the cost of revival. The cost generally increases with wait time, but everything was still manually set by the developers. It's arbitrary and isn't following any kind of formula. There's a bunch of examples where there are tombstones that have the same wait time, like Falcon and Strayed, but the cost differs by quite a lot. And you'll also find some examples of shorter wait times being more expensive than others, so there's not a direct relationship between wait time and cost, but they do have a loose correlation overall. The most interesting outlier to me, apart from Saldan, is Firekeeper Strowan. She's the Firekeeper who accepts the Soul Vessel and can respec your character. She still offers the service after death, but despite the wait time of only two hours, she's the most expensive revival, costing 15,000 souls. This is another one of those things that might give us a glimpse into the developer's rationale. Being able to respect your character was probably seen as a pretty big privilege compared to the previous games, so if you kill the NPC who offers that ability, they wanted to make you pay the most for that revival. When we look at all the NPCs who are able to be revived, it becomes apparent that the developers didn't overthink this mechanic in terms of how necessary it is, and basically just tried to make it globally available for pretty much everyone. So who isn't it available for? Tombstones aren't available for the Ancient Dragon or Vendrick, which makes sense because they're bosses who can already be revived with bonfire ascetics. It's also not available for invincible NPCs, of course. Oh, keep trying or Alsana or human form Nishandra, but otherwise they did try to make it available for almost every non-Phantom NPC, and that's where we can start finding some examples that feel pretty useless. 
Gran and Moral are the other two firekeepers at the start of the game, but they don't have any dialogue beyond some laughter. So you could pay to revive them too, but what's the point? <laughs> One interesting consideration here is that their tombstones move outside the hut, and the tombstones themselves are the only possible means of learning all of their names in-game. And as I mentioned earlier, quest lines can get frozen depending on where you kill an NPC. So you could revive Benhart here, or Lucatiel here, but that doesn't accomplish anything. Unless you just really wanted to say hi to remember the good old times, before you murdered them. Oh, my dear you can also revive all of the Milfinito, aside from the one in rags outside the Demon of Song. Now these aren't totally pointless, because there are some rewards you can receive after they die, but I feel pretty confident in saying that almost no one ever thinks to revisit the imprisoned Milfinito more than four hours after killing her. So reviving her and seeing her ghost is certainly among the rarest NPC interactions to ever happen in the game. You can revive the head of Vengarl, and what's pretty neat about that is it allows us to see his regular body. It's not the only way to see it, as you can also see it when you summon him for co-op, but it is a different model than his headless body, which is a bit bigger. Now I did try to kill off some of the invincible NPCs to see what would happen. In the data, they have the shortest timers, set to only one second, and also a revival cost of zero souls. This doesn't mean we can expect it to work, these values just seem to be placeholders, because they didn't include them for this mechanic. If we use Cheat Engine to kill Shalquar, we get some unique dialogue in the form of laughter that we don't get to hear otherwise. <laughs> but she doesn't stay dead and will simply respawn when we reload the area. If we do the same to Dinah and Tillo, their death actually does stick, and it's possible to lose them for the rest of the game. But regardless, no tombstone seems to show up. And the same goes for Veliger. We can get a few souls when we force his death, and he does stay dead as well, but no luck there either. If any modders can think of something I missed that would allow graves to spawn for them, please leave a comment below. But I suspect it goes beyond just forcing them to die, as they probably lack the proper event scripts involved. Oh, and this doesn't really relate to anything else, but I just wanted to point out how the Tombstone Ghosts have their cloth physics enabled. We can make their clothes react to our movements. And the animation for the Rat King being summoned is oddly adorable. So that covers how the tombstones work, but before ending this video, I think it's interesting to consider how aggering NPCs in the first place was also changed. It helps paint a picture of how Dark Souls 2 was trying to be more forgiving about attacking NPCs overall. In Demon's Souls and Dark Souls 1, NPCs becoming aggressive was determined by how much health was lost. There are some subtle differences in how those two games handle that, but it all comes down to NPCs losing a certain percentage of their health. In Demon's Souls, most NPCs become aggressive when they lose 20% of their HP, and in Dark Souls, they become aggressive when they lose more than 10% of their HP. Dark Souls 2 switched things up by moving over to only counting the number of hits. Almost everyone in the game aggros after hitting them exactly three times, regardless of how much damage is done. Now, watch it. Well, if that's what you want. In some cases, this might sound less forgiving than the previous games. When we remember that Elwyn punches in Dark Souls only did one damage, and we have to remove more than 10% of their HP, it means we can punch Andre over 100 times without any penalty. So NPCs in Dark Souls 2 always getting mad after 3 hits might sound less forgiving, but I'd argue that it isn't, and the opposite is actually true. Someone intentionally barehand punching NPCs in the previous games is kind of a fringe case, as the issue is typically what happens when you accidentally bump a shoulder button, with a weapon still equipped. Since aggering was dependent on the amount of damage done, any decently upgraded weapon was likely to anger most NPCs with a single attack. You no longer had to worry about this in Dark Souls 2. It doesn't matter if you had massive damage and nearly killed an NPC in one or two hits, the game still required three hits total to make them mad, and that was much harder to do by accident compared to the previous games. Ignoring the fact that the Moon Butterfly set made NPCs mad really quickly because of how its poison buildup effects got counted as hits. 
pissing them off without even hurting them. How quickly it makes them angry seems like a bit of a design oversight, because they're not even getting poisoned first. If what angers NPCs in Dark Souls 2 is a tangent you're interested in hearing more about, I recently posted a topic about it on Reddit, and you can check out the discussion there. Though the following Soulsborne games haven't gone quite as far as Dark Souls 2 in alleviating NPC deaths, they still continue to iterate around the idea of attacking NPCs. In Dark Souls 3, Absolution was made available from a statue instead of a regular NPC. This means unlike Oswald from Dark Souls 1, you can't kill off the source of Absolution and ever lose that ability. And in Sekiro, they did something that's a bit more in line with how most other games handle things. You're forced to put your weapon away around some important NPCs, so you won't be able to attack them in the first place. As is the case with many things from Dark Souls 2, the NPC tombstones are another experimental feature that tends to be forgotten. In this case, it might be for the best. It was a very gamey sort of thing that's kind of hard to justify in lore. Why are they all turning into ghosts instead of Halloween? And why can every unimportant weirdo easily communicate from beyond the grave? Oh, I'm sorry. I was just daydreaming, I think. Their implementation is a bit dissonant with how we expect things to work in this universe. Nonetheless, it was an interesting attempt at mitigating moments of indiscretion from the player. And there's just something kind of cool about seeing these ghostly interactions that a lot of players don't even know about. I'd like to thank Jester Patches, Moonlight Ruin, and Stade for assistance with research and troubleshooting. I'll link to all their social media below. They're people you'll want to follow if you're a fan of Dark Souls 2. If you'd like to support this channel, please consider liking, commenting, or subscribing, all the usual stuff that helps. You can also support me via patreon.com slash illusorywall. An extra special thanks to all of my backers at the Evil Vagrant tier. And until next time, consider killing some NPCs in Dark Souls 2 if you haven't seen this for yourself before. You'll just have to wait a few hours.